to have customers come twice. <laughs> and one lady even brought her mother along, and that's a real compliment. Now, I have to make it, Charlie, I know that this should be very formal, Dr. Hall, Professor Hall, but we're friends and so we can be a little more informal. In fact, I noticed you took off your jacket. It was the temperature, I guess. But anyway, mm -hmm. I wanted to make a correction. In 1953, the firm of Wertheim and Vanderplug was formed. That Jack, Jakob Vanderplug was an architect. That's the first time in the San Francisco or possibly California area where a landscape architect joined an architect and became one office. So the clients could come to you, you could design the house, you could design the landscape. What used to be that you go out and um, uh, the architect is here, the landscape architect is here, the client is in the middle, and there was no agreement. And the worst thing you can do to a client is let them know that there are more than one possibility. So if you can solve all the problems before you go to the client, it's a big advantage. So that was in 53. But Ernest came to California in 1939. Those were, that were there last night knew that I started spading Mrs. Stern's estate. So I was working since 39. Now, anybody who doesn't have a computer from 39 to 13 is more than 70 years. So in those 70 years, if we, even if you're a German Dummkopf, you know what a Dummkopf is? Nothing in there. <laughs> uh, you learn something in those years. And I want to share uh, some of that with you. I'm limited to now only 58 minutes. I don't know, Texas time goes much faster than San Francisco time. But very often, I am with nurserymen. And uh, I remember one convention that I was at, and we were standing in line to, to eat, and um, the man in back of me talked to his friend and said, you know, we hired a woman, young woman from Cornell, and Cornell has a darn good landscape architecture department. Obviously not, not as good as this one here, but uh, how can we ever compete with Texas? But, um, and he said, you know, she knows nothing about plants. And, and she, she isn't worth anything to me. And I turned around and said, do you know what the training is all about in landscape architecture? Don't complain. If you want to, if she's a good designer, be happy. And if you need to learn plants, teach her plants. You know the plants, you can teach her. Anybody can learn plants. Not everybody can be a good designer. So I'm very much in favor of having the nursery industry, may it be growers, may it be retailers, may it be seed people, whatever, understand what landscape architecture is all about. In this particular university, they're, they're miles apart instead of being next door to each other. However, they are right next to engineering and architecture, which is equally important. Now, do you know, uh, oh, this is very interesting. You know, it's like in Congress, the Democrats on one side, the Republicans on the other, more horticultural people were here, more landscape architects on this side. We can't have that. We have to intermingle more. And now, um, we, we have anybody from the faculty here? I didn't notice any hands of the landscape division. Well, let me tell you what landscape architects are involved in. In residential work, in commercial work, downtown development and renewal, planning of university campuses. Sometimes they don't do that in Texas. Planning. <laughs> Landscape of grammar school and high schools, special features like in Washington, D.C., President Roosevelt Memorial, the Vietnam Memorial, and others. They were all designed by top-notch landscape architects. Um, development of new city as it is happening in China, tremendous field, tremendous jobs that are being done by landscape architects, both American, Chinese, and European. 
highway planning, which involves storm management, highway bank planting, erosion control, and many other exposures. Arboretum and Botanical Garden. That's a fantastic field. I love to design an arboretum. Um, but are you qualified? That's another question. Design of golf courses, riverfront, front, golf uh, development of ski areas. This was the only time that I got paid when we developed a ski area for skiing. We had to ski down where we wanted to put the lifts. We had to ski down where the skiers were going to go. Wonderful thing, feeling I'm getting paid for this. I mean, this, this is something you don't experience in every generation. Uh, power line design, city parks, forest service, a whole forest service had many landscape architects uh, working, roof gardens, green roofs and green walls, installation of sewer lines and gas lines. We, in, we did a 14 mile sewer line in Lake Tahoe right next to the river. To do that and not to do any damage to the, um, uh, to the river and teaching sewer line personnel in their class by themselves, not to stand on any plants and only be in those 10 feet that was allowed to work in. But we taught them. And this is wonderful when you can teach sewer line people what plants are all about. And um, we were involved in that case in, we had, we, all 14 miles is recorded on a drawing and every plant growing in that area where the sewer line was recorded. So now the Theria Club and, and other people wanted to see the same things there. So you have a list, hopefully you know what you're talking about. And now the problem was, how can we get all these plants propagated? No nursery was carrying it. So the UC, UC Davis, um, Professor Lyther, and his crew started uh, experimenting on how we can propagate the various things like Ceonotus prostrata, Tostaphylus nevadensis. I just have to impress you that I know a couple, three plants. Um, uh, how do we propagate them? And if I would have only an hour longer, I can tell you about it, but Charlie is looking at me and saying, better get, get on. Uh, the hospital landscaping. The oil, the pipeline in Alaska was a major landscape problem. What to plant on those areas. I mean, the, the profession is very diversified. Knowledge about trees and their maintenance. I look at your trees over here, and every time we plant a tree, it's like making a baby. I don't know if you know about that, how that's done, but <laughs> those things sometimes happen. Now that baby, grows up, needs, when it gets to be teenagers, they, they eat you out of house and home, and then you have to send them to a university, and we don't even want to talk about that price. But a tree is very similar. Look at some of these wonderful trees we thought today, oak trees, huge. What does it cost to maintain them? Now, you didn't think about it when you created that child. And we have to think about maintenance as we create that child in form of a plant when we're planting it. The trees that you plant, the shrubs that we plant, the flowers, they all take maintenance. And the bigger the baby grows into an adult like you are, it's harder to maintain you until you leave the nest. And then you even come back with the grandchildren. That's another problem. But just translate that into what plants do. We can't create anything without experiencing taking care of it. And trees become more for maintenance as they grow. They're wonderful. Not to talk about wives. ADA regulation, knowledge about garden furniture and all the accessories that we use in the garden made be play equipment for the children. And art, who is using art in the garden? Very important item. And so we need to know about that. How to use water in the garden, running water, stream beds, etc. These are just a few items that come under landscape architecture. 
those of you who are in the landscape architecture department might have learned something new that you haven't taken up yet. Now we go from the Republicans over to the Democrats. And what can they do in, in our field? Well, you can work in a garden center. Now, we are very much involved since 1954 in designing garden centers, not only in this country, but also in Europe, in Australia, in South Africa, and some other places in the world. And um, I want to talk about a few minutes, and I ask to be reminded about 15 minutes before I'm supposed to close this session to talk about it. I hope we get there. But you're, pro you're you're going to be working for a landscape contractor. You might be working in landscape maintenance. We have wonderful landscape maintenance firms today that are really knowing what they're doing, which was not the case 20 years ago. And it is a very high field. You just can't get a job there to mow a lawn. That's just a minor item of it. And uh, we uh, have greenhouse production, which you're learning here. We have field production. You know, we are farmers, really. We are not growing soybeans, we are not growing corn, we are growing shrubs and trees, like on a farm. But that is, simple. that is not as simple as it sounds. And we can work in the Arboretum. What a wonderful thing to be in charge of a botanical garden. Not just only for the fee, but for the satisfaction. But if you do that, you have to also be good in politics. Because when you have a job like that, politics are very much involved. In fact, I learned today from one of your instructors that politics even are used in, in the university. You don't get the budget and you don't get what you need, but that's part of life. And so we need to have a course of how to handle the management of a university. Wouldn't that be an interesting subject? Um, we are working for the State Department, Highway Department. It's a big field. Many landscape architects are involved in that. We want to make, go into seed production or seed research. Uh, we might become a salesperson for a big company like Imperial Nurseries, Monrovia Nurseries, or many other good names. Those people are valuable because they are, know about the products and new introductions, the research department of those companies. We have to maintain the hospital. We have to maintain air airports. These are big jobs. The man who is maintaining San Francisco Airport is having gray hairs because it's in a very, very exposed area. A lot of wind, a lot of fall, and what tolerates those conditions? You, don't, you are not ready to take that job right now. You have to be in the field. Managing plant departments for the big boxes. You know, we talk about uh, Lowe's and uh, Home Depot and Target and others. To manage those departments or to manage regional things needs experienced people. And let's not belittle our competition. They are learning how to hire good people. And that's one of your futures. And last but not least, maybe you want to become a professor. Now we let other people tell you how difficult that is to get tenure. So all I wanted to say is all these things are jobs that are currently existing. And where do you fit in? Now, my always, I always like to mention to people if you went to a very good college, and we're assuming that is true here, and you're now graduating with honors, you are still only at the bottom of the stair, and you have to climb the stair. But you will be climbing the stairs faster, unless you're 93, and then it's not so fast. Uh, uh, because the people who do not have that education cannot climb that stair. But beware of the fact that you're just starting in the profession. You have the tools to understand it better, but don't think that you are quite ready to take over the company where you're going to be working. Because, and when you apply for a job, think about 
What can I do for this person? You know, we feel, and I went through the same thing. You know, I know everything and feathers up there. But when you're starting to work, uh, you find out that you didn't know everything and that you have to learn. And what can I give the boss for whom I want to work? What can I contribute to that company? That's what you want to do. When you have an interview, you might have an interview of 10 minutes. So have your best foot forward and think in the terms of the person that is employing you. And then you have a much better chance. We need to give, we cannot take. It's not the salary and not the benefits. What can I give there? How can I be valuable to the person that is offering me a job? Don't forget that because that's very important. Now, one of the things that I'm so interested in is that we establish a good relationship between horticulture, landscape architecture, landscape architecture, architecture, landscape architecture, engineering, civil engineering, structural engineering. All the people, we have to have a good relationship with the contractor. If we're a landscape architect, all those contractors don't know what they're doing. Well, that's not the right attitude. I just had a, I have a very small landscape job in, uh, in Walnut Creek, California. And I had spent five hours with a man who was estimating the job. He had plans in front of him. But what I want to establish is what does he think of the job, of our drawings? How can we do it better? How can we cut cost? You needed to work together. You're not saying, man, you're doing it for this price, and if you overlooked something, you will get broke. That's a fantastic wrong thinking process. If it's a good contractor, I need him for this job, I need him for the next job, I need him for the other job. I don't want to break a contractor. So you need to work together. Now, many people in landscape architecture are not trained well enough to make good construction drawings. I obviously, this does not apply to Texas A&M and College Station, but it's very true. And some people are more geared to design than construction. So then you have to have other people working for you that know that. Now, a plan goes now to, um, to the nursery. And the retail nursery looks at, oh, well, these plants won't grow here. They don't know about our water and so on. I don't like that. I think we need to work together. We, if we are working in a, in a foreign element, like if I would be working here, I have to go to your department. I have to go to the local nurseryman. I have to go to your botanical garden. I have to learn what the local thing is all about. And then no, use my creativity to uh, to come up with a good solution. Now, that means that if I visit with you, I don't want you to say, well, Ernest knows nothing about oak trees that grow in Texas without water. We need to work together and teach each other so that the product is good, because whom are you working for? Whom am I working for? We are working for our client. We are working for the people that are paying for it, and we need to have one front, and, and that means give and don't take. Try as much as possible to educate the other person in the other line, because the green industry is one industry, as far as I'm concerned. We are not different departments, and if we want to be successful in this green industry, we need to get a better attitude about the other person that is working in our industry. Now, um, I wanted to tell you, who, who plans to go into the nursery industry, into garden centers, into retail? Only one person? Two person? You don't have to be shy, you can raise both hands. Now, do you know what a garden center is all about? You know how the name actually came about? 
When we designed Orchard Nursery in 1954, the first retail nursery that really was designed from ground up, uh, we decided that we couldn't have a retail nursery that is only open in spring and in summer. It used to be that in summer you go to Canada fishing and in winter you go to Florida doing whatever one does in Florida in wintertime. And, uh, People were graduating from good schools, horticultural schools, and they wanted to have a year-round job. And that sounds strange to you now, but at that time, it didn't exist. And uh, so how can we operate a year-round? And so the first thing that was introduced was, let's have Christmas sales. That kept us going until December 31st even though Christmas was on the 25th, but then we had a sale of all the things that we didn't sell before. Um, and then January and February were dead months, and so you had to invent something to do for the people to keep your crew busy and paid for. We, we mentioned that we only like to have skiers working for us because they would take three weeks off in January or February, go to Sun Valley or or Whistler Mountain in Canada, or Colorado, but uh, that didn't always work. So the whole theory was to keep our crews busy. Now, then we have people like Dr. Call coming along with his economic uh, advice. And uh, so you keep your people busy, you have enough money to pay them, but is there any money left over? And so then you had to address well, are we making money at Christmas time? And the answer was really no. So all of it needed to be resought. It was not just paying the employees, but also making money to justify the places open. The overhead is just the light overhead, the heating and so on that we're going through. So we basically started thinking in terms of operating on a year-round basis. Now, you have some people like NATOP. Uh, NATOP just closed all their garden centers. They are also grower operation and a landscape operation. And they are only open spring, and then they have a big fall. But they can do that. Now, does that mean all the retail places should close? No. But I'm always, always trying to tell you that there are more possibilities than one because one person is doing one thing doesn't mean that we don't have a new iPad in another three months from now. You know, it's, it's creativity. And uh, what is going to happen when Amazon is going to sell shrubs and trees delivered to your place overnight? <laughs> can, can very well happen. And so we need to be prepared to, to adjust to the changes that are happening. Now, let me take a little time to tell you about a couple garden centers. This is Al's garden center in Beaverton, Oregon, outside of, outside of um, Portland. And uh, uh, they are also growers. They have growing facilities. They grow very good plant material. And so they are very greenhouse oriented. Everything, so what you're seeing here, how does that work? It's the green button. Hmm? The green button in the middle. Ah, I didn't know between red and green. So this whole complex here is a greenhouse. This here is a warehouse. So the first thing that you have to think about is parking. How much parking do you need? Well, we designed another place for them and it was based that this was all parking. Now, you drive in, this is a busy highway and uh, you come in here and there's a front door. So when you're driving in, you see a very nice structure in front of the greenhouse that uh, invites you in. Now, when we're busy on on Mother's Day, for example, we have a highway patrol person there that will tell people to go this way or this way. If that's filled, we bring it there. 
It is very important when you have a parking lot to keep the parking lot moving. You don't want, you like people to enjoy the visit to the garden center, but you always want them to leave because other people need the parking space. In a parking, <laughs> it's contradictory. Like marriage can be contradictory too, but it's very nice when it works. Uh, I meant marriage. The parking lot has to work too. So the first thing was parking. Uh, when you, but this is a landscape strip and this is a landscape strip. So when people pass by, they really only see the greenhouses, but they don't see any more. And we can't display any plants in the front there because it's too far and you're supposed to keep your eyes here. But this landscape strip in color most of the year. Now people that are in Michigan don't have that privilege there. But uh, it's very important to make an impact on people when they're coming by. And everybody knows they're passing by Al's Garden Center. We have a brick wall there, we have a brick wall there, very nice brick wall with a sign and with flowers in front of it. So even if you're passing by, you're aware where you pass by. And sometimes you're going to say, you know, we ought to go in there sometime. Now, one of the things that you have to do is thinking of where does your product come in. So your product comes in over here, over there, backs up to the loading dock. Now, how big does a loading dock have to be? So you back up a truck, a semi. You have a forklift that unloads it. A forklift needs at least 10 to 12 feet, depending on its size, to back up from the semi to turn around to go wherever you want to go. Now, what happens to most loading docks? Pretty well, they're filled up. I don't like that because the next trucks come in and they want to unload and there's no space for it. So we built a greenhouse here. That's our receiving greenhouse. All the uh, Danish carts come in and are going into this greenhouse. And from there, the sales personnel will come from over here knowing what they need to display and pull from there. The other thing that we are doing for that is, uh, has, I hope that several of you have worked in a nursery. Now you sold something and your boss is happy, you know, you made a $75 sale of, uh, you don't go any rhododendrons here, but, but rhododendrons you did in North Carolina when you grew up. Um, wonderful thing in full bloom, I bought them and now there's a sale tag on it, and you hope that not the next customer takes the sale tag off and buys the two. You have to be very careful. You, you're insulting your customer if you're not delivering the right plant. So we're bringing it into this, in, into this greenhouse over there. And there's a person in charge of watering. Now I can tell you more than I have fingers on the two hands how often things are put in the shipping area and forgotten. Now, don't forget your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your wives, you get into trouble. But don't forget at all, with underlined three times, the product that you sold to a customer that needs love and care, water and protection from the sun, protection from the wind, and so in this case it's there, completely protected and somebody is responsible. When that, if there's one plant wilting, that's the end of that person's job. It's very, very serious. And uh, so then it's very easy to come out with doors along there and going on the delivery truck. Now this thing here is all warehouse and this thing in the front is offices. And very often we are overlooking what offices should be. You know, a typical old time nurseryman said we don't need an office. I want people to work. We don't need to sit down to do anything. Well, that was the old partially Swedish, German, Dutch people 
that were slave drivers, darn good nurserymen, but didn't quite have the know-how of how to treat staff. You know, those of you who uh, heard the talk last night, General MacArthur said to me, you're only as good as your troops, and the troops are only as good as your general. So that applies to any business. If you're a leader, you have to be darn good, and you know how to train the people who make you. I'm made by my partners and by my staff. They are really needed, all the compliments that you just gave me. But you need officers, and you need to be efficient with officers. Now, when we came in here, there is, the first thing is tropical plants. You are entering and you know that you're in a nursery. Now, some people, particularly some clients of ours in England, like to see garden furniture. I want to see plants because we are in the plant business. If you're growing seeds, if you're growing little plants, big plants, we're in the plant business. And I think the public comes to us primarily because we're in the plant business. All the other things help to make money, but we, I want that first impression. Now, that's my opinion. It's not everybody's opinion. So it's a wonderful little place there. Right at the entrance there, we have a little coffee stand. Now, coffee, sometimes it's complimentary, and sometimes it is not. We have clients where we have restaurants in England, 500 people we seat. 500 people. I don't even know a restaurant here where 500 people. But that's a different culture and it works. And, um, uh, but in this case, we are selling merchandise. Now here is a greenhouse that is basically for outdoor plants. So we can, it can rain, it can snow. And this here is where shrubs and tree, primarily shrubs are all covered, but with roofs that completely open. And then we have more, this is all trees here. We have a covered walkway that goes around. A covered walkway is something that guides people. When we have a covered walkway, suddenly we find people are walking this way. In the greenhouse, this greenhouse is oriented this way, the ridges. If it would be oriented this way, it wouldn't work. For some reason, Charlie, people will follow the ridge of the greenhouse. Now, another thing is, when you develop, Terry, when you develop a retail greenhouse, how far apart are your posts going to be? I'm putting you on the spot, but we know each other, so I get away. 12 feet. No way. <laughs> I can't afford to have one post here. Oops, I can't do that. Uh, three, six, up to there about. We want them a minimum of 20 feet apart, preferably 30 feet. We have a lot of jobs. We, if we are in metric, it's 31 foot six. Uh, nine, nine meters. Um, uh, because the posts are nuisance. You know, it works maybe when we have tables and so on, but when we have free flow displays, posts are nuisance. The less posts we have, the better. So now the old German nurseryman would say, Ernest, I need a bigger beam that costs more money. Well, that doesn't count, because what counts is that I can have a much better traffic flow, and that sells merchandise. So, and how wide should your greenhouse be? The whole greenhouse? The width. The whole then? Yeah. Each greenhouse or two greenhouses? Oh, okay. Each, oh, we got two greenhouses going on? Let's see. Well, I'll help you out. Nothing less than 42 feet. So that means we have one area 42 feet by 30 feet without posts. Very, very important. It costs more money, but it's important. Now, if we are having a pretty good sized beam there, be sure that beam is high enough 
that we can go with Danish carts and plants underneath it, that we even can go with some pretty good sized plants underneath it. So when you're building greenhouses, those dimensions become very important. And what does the architect know about this? Nothing. But you need to know how a garden center should operate. Now, we have doors, you know, at the side. The door. How big should that door be? It's a sliding door. We have openings up to 60 feet where the doors go up like a garage door. That means suddenly I'm open to the outdoor sales area. So here, all this opens up, and, and this opens up. And when the weather is favorable, this is very, very important for traffic flow. But now we have windstorm, down it goes, and we can still be inside and protected. And we have done a number of garden centers where we have a lot of outdoor plants covered. And when it is a snowstorm, or when it rains like mad in spring, and the moment it stops, people come and go there. The people that are our competitors, that have not that space, don't have any customers. So it draws people. In spring, we have a sex drive that, uh, don't get your minds going, of wanting to see flowers, wanting to see spring. And that drives people in. Sometimes they come to the garden center just to be surrounded by the beauty of it. They buy nothing. But if they come and love us, that's a very important thing because they will come back. Okay, so the traffic flow here, Ernest, your jittery. Uh, the traffic flow goes from here to there, and from here to there, into there. And there's a lot of circulation in this area. These are all 42 foot wide houses with uh, 25 foot spacing. And, um, and now we ran into a problem with poinsettias. They're, they're poinsettia growers and they fill this whole house up with poinsettias. Now, we plan to have them arrive here, but this is a long way to go. So we had to redesign this thing and have the poinsettia trucks coming there. Why? The labor cost of going from here to there was just simply too high on a poinsettia where we have to compete with Home Depot or other in prices. So the point is, everything needs to be sought. Do we do perfect jobs? Never. We try to do perfect jobs, but this turned out to be they are coming in every day with a truckload of poinsettias, and they're selling them. Now, we have checkouts over here. Now, what you want to think about is when you come into a garden center, you don't want to run in, if possible, into the checkout area. Because if there are long lines, think about it in the supermarket, long lines, Maybe I'm going to 7-Eleven or some similar store. I don't have the time to stand in line. So that's a, that thinking process goes through several people that are our customers. So I don't want to see the long lines. It's a checkout when I come in. I want to see pretty plants. Now, <clears throat> I was mentioning, I think, in one of the sessions we had earlier, uh, Parking spaces and checkout, number of checkouts relate to each other. If we have, we had uh, 500 parking spaces at Hicks Nursery in the remodeling in Long Island. And Mr. Hicks was a dear friend when he was alive, uh, came to me in the opening time and said, Ernest, we don't have many customers. We have 500 parking spaces that are not filled. And I said, let's go and check how much money we took in. We went to each cash register and added it up and was considerably more than any time before. What had happened was, because we had more checkouts, we turned the parking lot quicker, and that created some of the empty spaces. But it also created 
in years to come, when more customers came, that it's still working today, and we uh, opened it in uh, September 11. The opening was right after September 11 in New York, which did not help at all to get a return on investment. We were out of, out of customers during that period for at least three or four weeks, and a lot of their customers were, in, were killed in this situation. So how do we anticipate return on investment when things like that happen? You have to be prepared for all, all kinds of situations, independent of the fact that you also lost a lot of friends in the community of your church and so on. Uh, thank you. So let's go to another country. This is over here. Which one was it next? The next one. Let's be taken by. <laughs> uh, this one? Okay. Now let's go, one, go, go to one other. Here. This was Huskins in near south of London. And uh, uh, this is the main street here. Here's the entrance. There's one of your roundabouts. People come in here, and then you drive here. And Mr. Huskins, also a good friend of mine, uh, didn't want to have any cars driving in front, in front of uh, the place. Because as you come out of a building, if there's traffic there, and then children go across, and it's much safer. So we, we do it only here and over here, but never across. This is a covered walkway. It's a big parking lot from here to there, and there's the entrance. And in England, you drive on the left-hand side, and so you enter the place on the left-hand side rather than the right-hand side. So you're coming in, and this was the walkway here, and this was the checkouts. So when you came in, you didn't even see the checkouts. Mr. Huskins felt that he wanted to be protected over the outdoor sales area. The green here is open, with this color is all protected. And that meant that you had to have covered walkways, greenhouses with open sides, where things that are normally going outside would do well. We also want have a restaurant. Over here is a restaurant. And uh, so you draw people to over here. Now, what happened was we had 10-foot aisles. Now, 10-foot aisles is a pretty good aisle. But what we didn't rec recognize in planning is that anybody who came to the restaurant might not want to go out here, but wants to go back and go out there. So now we had a two-way traffic where we really did not anticipate a two-way traffic. As I said, you're not perfect any time. So the next space we designed for them, it became a 12-foot wide, and it works a lot better. But uh, never make your aisles too narrow, because you not only have two-way traffic, but you also have me standing here admiring this product with my shopping cart here, and now I'm creating a one-way street. You need to study what does the customer do, and that is not what you think should be done, watch the customer. Everything we learned, we learned really from the customer watching the customer, having an open mind, never saying, I'm always right, saying, what makes other people come here? What makes other people be happy? Now, all this whole place is paved. Now, paving is, is something we learned when we designed the first garden center. We interviewed a number of the customers. Now, if you go out, 
and ask your customer, what do you think of our place? What can I do better? The typical, wonderful American way is, oh, I love your place. It's every perfect. Well, that's not what I wanted to hear. What I wanted to hear was reality. So we made appointments with some of our landscape clients, with some of our architectural clients, but primarily with people that were good customers. They would call, Ernest wants to visit with you. Ernest came with a nice flower basket for them as a thank you. And now we find, now the Catholics were over there, the Protestants were over there, their church, in between with Orchard Nursery. Nobody came on Sunday. Well, the mother said to me, Ernest, we get all dolled up when we go to church. Our little girls, uh, at that time it was, they were still little, uh, with shiny black shoes, pretty skirts on, and you have only mud, and who knows, your sprinklers go on when it's all unexpected. We can't come to your place. We have to change clothes and then come back. In the meantime, there's a football game on, and if it's a Texas A&M football game, we definitely have to be at the stadium and can't buy any plants. Well, we decided we needed to pay the total nursery. That was like spending millions. That was in the nursery industry. Ernest Voisheim has gone overboard. That's what the nursery industry said. But pretty soon the competition copied it. We were the first ones who did this. Now the point that I'm wanting to make is it is extremely important to follow other retail industries. Why should we be dirty? Why should be, we be different when there are modern airports in Dallas and Washington, God knows where? We're used to wonderful things, except on the plane. And you know the tall people on that little plane from Dallas to here? I felt sorry they had to cut off their legs to get, get in. <laughs> and not where they were sitting, they had to put the legs in another seat. Well, we can't do that, and I'm very, very serious. We, they're the same people that come to us, and we have to create better facilities. Ernest, we, we have about seven minutes, and I, and I wanted to make sure that we got to a couple of topics that you told me to remind you about, so. Why don't you ask one okay. of so, Obviously, landscape architecture has been very instrumental in transforming the way we do the garden center business. Now, let's, let's kind of fast forward through time and consider the field of landscape architecture in, rel in relation to some huge societal issues like water, climate change, and, and we see architects moving to a more biophilic biomimicry type of design, green roofs, green, green walls. So as you consider the, the future of your field, I mean, you, you've had more decades of experience than most people do in two lifetimes. So as you consider the field of landscape architecture, what contributions to societal issues do you see the field making? Well, all the things you mentioned. And uh, in the, for example, in the green roofs, I feel that uh, retail should pick that up much more than it has been done. Because that little shed in your uh, tool shed that you have, why don't we have a green roof on that? Uh, don't answer that. Uh, I mean, there, there are so many things that we can do without putting it actually on our main roof. But I think that, um, um, I think the green walls is something very important. I think in be living in a condominium and having a little car balcony, but there's a bare wall like this wall here, and we could have picture frames of, of a green picture frame rather than necessarily a whole green wall. I think we need, landscape architecture needs to address that much more. But landscape architecture also needs to think about maintenance. If we are doing that for people who are not trained to think of maintenance, then it will be a failure in time. And we can't afford to have it a failure. Um, also, I think that um, garden center design is 
a mixture of architecture, landscape architecture, full understanding of the garden center industry and how it works. So the landscape architect certainly has a place there. The architect has a place. And the architect must work with the landscape architect or the landscape architect must work with the architect. You have to form teamwork. And the teamwork should always start at the beginning of the job. We did a, we did a roof garden uh, project before it ever started. There was a meeting with the engineer, with the architect, with the landscape architect. We wanted trees on the roof garden. How heavy will the trees be? Now, anybody on the landscape department, how heavy is a redwood tree when it's 30 years old? We can't think of today or tomorrow. And what does the big branches do? The big branches, the weight of, I'm not an engineer, the weight of the branches come to the trunk and that weight comes down and has the engineer provided for that. Very difficult to find out. I worked with the forest service, I worked with the lumber industry, but we need to think about those things. And you have a redwood tree right here, a cut of it in the lobby. Um, I don't think I answered your question adequately, but the opportunities, uh, the opportunities of working as a team, and that involves the seed people. Now, if you go to the spring trials in California, when they're introducing X number of new varieties, I don't know if that's really the right thing to do. How can we comprehend in our head? And now I'm the owner, and I, I make notes and photographs. Now I come to my staff. I have to educate the staff. Am I really capable of educating them? Because I just learned it. It's a very difficult thing. How many of the new varieties do we want to carry? And what do we know about? Yes. You mentioned the architect and the landscape architect. I'm sorry. I'm not you said you mentioned the architect and the landscape architect and designing the, the uh, garden center. And you get your, your greenhouse wide enough to turn around and everything. But it takes a horticulturist then to decide what products go in there and how to display them and how to put the color together and that kind of thing. So I just want you to mention that the horticulture is being part of that team. Too. Terry, <laughs> in my own case, I'm providing it You're with right. my training. So what I missed, what you corrected was, you have to have a landscape architect that is very horticulturally oriented. But we also have to have a client the client can help, but when, when, when we're designing this project or any other project, uh, we, are dis we are defining every place where product goes and how much. We know that this wall over here, from there to there, those eight feet, are having product number 101. And when we are stocking it, there's a list and people know that product goes on that shelf and this tree goes into this department. It's completely sought through. Now, I make, I make people work on it. This is a very tough job to have the staff, the nursery people, the hard goods people, the garden furniture people. How many, how much is one, one set, a nice set of garden furniture that's 100 square feet? Actually, it doesn't. But if I'm here admiring this set, you have to allow for the person. And every walkway is half designed to this department and half designed to that department because this department now has to produce X number of dollars. Now, up two minutes. 33 seconds. So up, we'll have some time for questions at the Fox and the Hound afterward. But your closing comments in, in 20 seconds. I want to leave you with the thought of this is a wonderful industry and follow 
I, I couldn't think of a better place to work as I have done now over 70 years. And I have no regret. And I'm hoping that I will be around for another five or so. And, and we constantly learn. And if any of you have questions, I welcome it on an email. If I'm, how many people do we have? A hundred people in here? I can't answer everyone overnight. But if I can help you or share with you some experiences, uh, I'd be very happy to do so. Just remember, you, we rely on the younger generation. You are our future. You need a little advice from those more mature people, but you will be carry on this industry. And thank you for being here. Thank you again for being here. That concludes the session, or at least the formal session. There'll be a, an informal session at the Fox and the Hound a little bit later, so those of you can make it. Students, thank you very much for being here. Make sure you sign the sign-in sheets for the appropriate level of credit that we were previously agreed upon. And have a great rest of the day. Outstanding, my friend. I think I gave everything back. I think so too. Let me grab this one. Oh. Perfect. I'll, I'll sl good. slide this out of the way.